Hi, everyone. Today, I'm extremely excited to be speaking with Dr. Hani Talebi, who is a licensed psychologist and licensed specialist in school psychology with a focus with focused experience in pediatric psychology. Dr. Talebi is an affiliate faculty member in the in the UT Austin Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and a courtesy affiliate faculty member in the UT Austin Department of Pediatrics and the UT Austin Department of Educational Psychology. In his role as Senior Vice President of Health System in Systems Integration, Dr. Talebi's work focuses on advancing collaborative care and measurement-based care in primary care and health system settings. With more than 20 years of clinical experience, he has served in, variety, in a variety of roles, including Director of Pediatric Psychology at Dell Children's Medical Center, Director of Psychological Services at Dell Valley Independent School District, Director of Clinical Programming in various community mental health centers, and as a clinical consultative leader in the private sector. Dr. Talebi's administrative efforts at the juncture of the medical and mental health models have resulted in innovative program development, various quality improvement initiatives, and fiscally sustainable service provision platforms across milieus. So, Hani, thank you so much for joining me, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Omar. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you today. Yeah, it's such an important topic to be talking about mental health and, you know, more specifically dealing with it in kind of an adolescent population, which um, we see very closely something you've worked in and you specialize in, um, something I'm uh, very closely related to as well, just because my, my wife is in the field of child psychiatry, so I know that area very well. Um, so it's just such an important area. So I wanted to ask you first your journey into the mental health world and how that came about. Sure. Um, you know, I think everybody has a different kind of origin story. For me, um, I found that uh, the world was a very interesting place, and, and I was very interested in human behavior in general. Um, and the way I perceived things was very cognitive. When I was younger, it, it all related around um, logic and um, people's behavior was included in that in my mind was this isn't logical or this is logical and why did they choose this over that or and then that naturally segues into how people feel about those things um, so um, personally I ended up kind of um, participating in a lot of different summer camps when I was younger became a, a counselor in training and then a counselor and that naturally led to um, kind of uh, an interest in the the college sphere of um, really kind of exploring cognitive science. Um, I went to the University of California, Irvine in Southern California and a pretty robust program there that was a scientist practitioner model for both research and, and clinical work. And then that naturally segued into um, really parlaying into some research work, some um, work in the both the clinical field and clinical trial field for um, pharma companies. And then um, went into graduate school and, and kept pursuing all that stuff for a doctorate in clinical psychology. I have a PhD in combined psychology, which is clinical counseling in school. So uh, I consider myself a renaissance psychologist, and, and that was really perfect for me. I, I really like working in different domains and um, in a sense of polymathery, bringing it all together to solve kind of traditional problems in unique and creative ways. Um, that naturally lent itself to some opportunities to both um, continue doing clinical work while also doing research, um, being a clinician administrator in different health systems. And like you mentioned, my love is really pediatrics. I love working at that kind of cross-section of individuals who are diagnosed with um, medical illness, but also um, have some comorbid mental health issues going on. Um, so that it's always just been fascinating and, and never boring. That's awesome. That's fantastic. So we, you know, you just have to really walk out in the street and just see that we have a growing epidemic of mental health issues. Um, they're affecting our schools. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating that I, I know firsthand that in the, in the summertime, there's a big lull in the, the inpatient psychiatry wards. And then as soon as school starts, there there is an in, in influx of patients. And so you know, it's very fascinating to try to pinpoint what are the factors that are leading us and especially our younger population into this growing epidemic of mental health issues. And so what in your mind are the main causes of this epidemic growing right now? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, to your point about there being ebbs and tides to, to kids going inpatient or um, expressing and exhibiting more um, acute symptomatology, 
Um, a lot of folks think that depression is the, the most common, um, the highest prevalence rate of any mental health disorder. It's actually anxiety across mm -hmm. adults and children. And so when we think about those seasonal trends of the anxiety related to the honeymoon period being over of summer and the beginning of school, and then, um, you know, folks having some pretty extensive demands put on them and um, it, it can get really intense. Um, I think a lot of people, um, children in particular, without the right supports and uh, baseline resiliency end up really struggling. And, and this is not something that is atypical that has just started happening. Um, when we look at trends over time relative to child and adolescent mental health issues, they have increased over the last 20 to 30 years. They have steadily increased. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that is has been as acute as, as recently, but it is the trend is definitely toward um, kids and adolescents having a harder time as time has progressed. So this isn't naturally kind of a new thing, but the caveat is the public health crisis um, of the pandemic is a totally different world. And so that in and of itself has resulted in a, a totally new landscape that in multiple generations we really haven't seen before. Um, and it highlighted um, that yes, those issues predated the epidemic in the way of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use disorder, domestic violence, et cetera. Um, but they exacerbated those Achilles heels that we had. We were already struggling with those different presentations from a mental health standpoint. We were really struggling with behavioral health workforce shortages. We don't have enough psychiatrists. We don't have enough psychologists. We don't have enough people working in mental and behavioral health to be able to manage all those things. And so invariably wait lists became much, much longer. Um, the ability to, to understand how to negotiate the landscape became very, very different. I like to tell folks, folks if there was an unintended positive consequence of the public health crisis is that um, it really reduced the stigma around talking about mm -hmm. mental health issues because uh, folks who had traditionally said, I'm fine, I don't have any issues, I can self-manage everything, finally were acknowledging I'm really struggling with the social isolation piece, with the lack of patterns, with being with my family 24-7 and not really being used to that, those types of things. If there was an unintended, unintended posit positive or negative consequence of that, like I mentioned, it would be that we really started to, to recognize all those um, shortages that we were uh, struggling with beforehand because they kind of exponentially became worse. Um, you asked kind of specifically, why is this happening? What, what, is, what are some of the root causes of, of these issues being exacerbated as the decades have progressed? I think it's an amalgam of a lot of different things. And nobody's really pinpointed it's one thing over another thing. But, um, you know, we talk a little bit about the extent to which um, disconnection is really a, a big part of that. And so invariably people will ask, like, is this about social media? Is this about those little rectangles in our hands and the screens and all our time we mm -hmm. spend there? Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, that's that's yeah. one of many. I don't I don't want to say that it's a categorical phones did this, you know, cell phones did this to us and screens did this to us. But it absolutely has resulted in um, a lot of, of new kind of um, arenas that we have not really delved into in the past. And when right. you think about, you know, cell phones and things like that, they're supposed to be tools. They're great tools, right? If, if you're using them as a tool. But as human beings, we have this kind of behavioral response to pick it up all the time. If there's nothing going on, we pick it up all the time and, and try to get that reinforcement over and over again. One piece that I add to that for a lot of folks, I work with parents quite a bit. Parents were never trained on, we were the first round of guinea pigs who, who kind of started with the phones, mm -hmm. early adopters. And so we got kind of attracted to them just like the kids are now. And um, it's very, very challenging to, to be able to negotiate what that looks like, both as the caregiver and as the, the caregiver of the child. Um, so uh, it ends up being complicated in that sense. I think that there is, you know, some societal trends that have resulted in mm -hmm. increased suicidal ideation. We have, you know, globalization and the extent to which we are more connected to the news and the world around us has led to an intense sense of anxiety, something that used to happen halfway across the world. We just wouldn't have known right. about. Now it's in our face. It is for shock value. It is all those types of things. And, and so I think that that has ended up being a, a little bit more challenging. Um, the notion of self-reliance and resilience, um, mm -hmm. those used to be huge kind of America in particular was like big on self-reliance and we can handle this and this is us. And um, I think that has, has altered over time. There is this sense of 
um, I don't want to say entitlement because I think that's thrown on a lot of the recent generations, but mm -hmm. there is a sense of a, a sedentary get on the kind of um, people mover of life and let life happen to you as opposed to feeling an internal sense of a locus of control. What I do has an impact on kind of the world around me as opposed to the world around me impacts me and there's nothing I can do about that. So mm -hmm. I think we've lost some inherent skills there um, and we've lost the ability to be able to parlay them to our children. To say, hey, let's let's build on this kind of grit piece or resilience piece, or let's deal with distress. Um, parents these days have a really hard time letting kids sit with the discomfort of not feeling great all the time. And life isn't right. about feeling great. I think if we don't have exposure to that, we never figure out the right tools to to be able to garner, to be able to address it over time. So, um, so, and, and this may be a segue to kind of another topic for us to talk about is, you know, the model that we approach health from has altered. Right. And, and it is very medical and it is very symptom specific uh, and and thinking that, hey, let's deal with this one thing or let's deal with this one thing. And it becomes very, very fragmented. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I know that a lot of the work that you do in integrative medicine is really a, kind of runs contrary to that for the benefit of the patient, family system, et cetera. So um, I would love an opportunity to, to kind of hear about your thoughts on that front, too. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the main issues from the from the medical side is that we have compartmentalize these uh, issues, these, these uh, let's say, call them illnesses, whether you're dealing with anxiety, depression, or whatever, it's kind of a um, above-the-neck issue for psychiatry, neurology, and for psychology, and everything else is separated. And that's one thing. And the other thing is what you mentioned, which if we don't deal with these underlying root causes, we don't talk about them and we don't understand them, then the models of healthcare that we build that is trying to address this mental health care epidemic um, of all these issues, they're going to fall short because un until we understand that these kids need the, what you talked about, resilience um, and, you know, uh, an under, a different understanding, different perspectives, um, you know, training around phone use, social media use, limitations around that, until we have those things we are not going to be able to create a comprehensive care model that's going to be able to address all this. We'll, we'll be able to move kids along in that we can get them in to see the therapist, the, the psychiatrist, um, and address you know acute symptoms, um, more uh, suicidal ideations, those types of things. But we are not going to be able to really help and and um, you know fix these mental health issues for a lot of these adolescents. So. Um, I think, you know, the, the types of things that we're advocating for are exactly along the same lines of integrating all these systems together. I know you do a lot of that in your work. And so um, one thing I just wanted to point out on what, what you talked about was exactly that on the, you know, we were the kind of the guinea pigs. And, and I, I feel fortunate that I was still in that my childhood was partially without phones, right, to a, to a large degree. So we... You know, I, I feel it's very difficult for the kids now that don't know a life sure. other than what, what is there. And so I think that at least if you've experienced that life without phones and a lot of technology, you, you know um, the certain benefits that come along with it. And so and, and it's, as parents, it's important because then you try to give your child the same uh, you know, the, the, the same kind of you, re you replicate the same thing for your children. So. For example, if there's, you know, a movie to watch versus getting them to go outside and play, you know the benefits of that and you're going to push them to do that because you've experienced that. So I think as the generations go on, it might get tougher because there is now the next generation isn't going to know what it's even like to be without a phone from early on. So these are very important things that you brought up and I appreciate you putting them into such, um, good, such a good context. So, so I want to move to you know, the, the current model of psychiatry and psychology that is present. And because you have such good experience in both the, the, the you know, deep in the world of psychology and psychiatry, as well as a lot of ventures that you're doing, one of which we're doing together is around the, the kind of the whole care, holistic care model. So you have kind of the experience from both worlds. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on the current mental health care setup, where it falls short, and how it can be improved. Just a great response, you know, and you bring up a lot of really good points about 
um, you know, the extent to which folks are struggling um, across a lot of different dimensions, but really don't have the resources or the um, kind of appropriate trajectory to be able to address them in a meaningful, sustainable fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, to your question about kind of the, the current landscape in, in mental health, um, I like to tell people often that um, the only way that right now individuals are identified as um, requiring mental health support is either through law enforcement mm-hmm. or through an emergency department, right? Because that's what right. happens in a crisis mm-hmm. is that either law enforcement is called or they are taken to the emergency department and then something is figured out in the way of a, a service array and where they fit in that and all those types of things. It is actually relatively unique still, even, I mean, I'll say kind of pre-COVID, um, that folks would, you know, volunteer and of their own will go out to say, like, I'm, I'm kind of struggling. I need some help right now. Um, we just haven't been very good at that over time. Part of that is the system. Like you had mentioned before, if you envision the head being kind of separated from the body, that's mm-hmm. how we approach healthcare in the United States, yeah. which is so backwards. It makes no sense whatsoever, mm-hmm. right? We have right. to integrate those things. If we treated mental health the way we treated heart disease, the way we treated cardiac issues, the way we treated diabetes, all those types of things, it would be significantly more holistic and integrated. Mm-hmm. And we'd see not only better outcomes for the individuals involved, but we would see far less cost, right? This cost burden is is insane right now. Um, So when we talk about what could kind of alter in that sense, what could we be doing better is I'm huge on early intervention, early identification and early intervention. We know that mental illness is a pediatric illness. 50% of all lifetime mental health issues are present at the age of 14. Half of all lifetime mental health issues, 75%, three quarters of all lifetime mental health issues present at age 24. So we know that if we are able to universally screen folks, specifically through primary care, lots of people, most people will go to their primary care doctor, their pediatrician, if they're a child, every single time a patient goes through there, at least for that annual well check, they should be screened for mental health issues. We talk about mental health being like dental care. You go and get a cleaning twice a month, uh, twice a year. Why are you not going to to get a a checkup to make sure you're doing okay every six months? And that is, again, partly our kind of stigma around mental health. You're crazy. What's Mm. wrong with you? Why can't you handle things? And really, we need to shift that in a meaningful fashion. Early identification means that we're screening everyone. We figure out when they're in the mild range, the mild Mm. to moderate range. Because we know that outcomes are significantly better when we catch early and treat early. We can keep people in that mild to moderate range as Mm -hmm. opposed to have that excel into acute. And then they Mm -hmm. need kind of crisis intervention or those types of things. So that kind of feel to things is, you know, one element that I think is, is lost on a lot of folks. In addition, what we do in therapy makes a huge difference. For example, oftentimes... You know, the, the model has been kind of med heavy, like, let's just give psychopharm and, and you're on your way. Here's your mm-hmm. antidepressant. Here's your anxiolytic, those types of things. Right. Um, and therapy has been oftentimes not evidence based. It isn't the stuff that's supported through the literature and the research. Um, so that ends up kind of muddying the waters. So if we're using evidence based interventions, we're using what's called measurement based care in therapy. Yeah. Um, basically, what we're saying is we're going to track you every week to see, are you progressing? Are you regressing or is there treatment inertia? We should know that when you go to see your physician, you take vitals, you take your weight. These are Mm -hmm. objective measures so that we can tell, are you getting better? Are you your A1C for diabetes? Mm -hmm. All those types of things. We need a measure to track it Mm -hmm. quantitatively. We don't do that well in mental health and that needs to alter as well. So, you know, I, I think that part of it is a conceptualization of those things. And then the other part ends up being really specific and targeted interventions to, to alter and enhance um, the robust nature of what we're doing with folks. Yeah, all fascinating points. Uh, I want to ask you a question that came to my mind, which is you mentioned kind of the stigma around mental health and how we kind of break through that. You know, uh, one of the things that I struggle with is this keeping this balance between we, we talked about resiliency early on when, where you're like, you need mechanisms to be able to say, I can handle this, I can handle basic stressors and things like that. Everyone needs that because of the world we live in. But at the same time, there comes a point, especially in our, in our modern world, where 
we also need to be able to say, I need help and I need, you know, specifically mental health help. So, you know, and, and coming from more Eastern cultures, there is that, I would say, more uh, of a, uh, a focus on resiliency, especially when you add in a religious element to it as well, where, you know, the, this kind of an understanding that you, you need to be more res- resilient and uh, more more grateful for what you have, perhaps less um, less of a kind of a complaining, if you will, you know. So that type of a uh, a model is there. That type of a thought process is there. So this is one of the things that I personally struggle with as well. Is you know that resiliency for telling yourself, you know, I need to keep doing better. I need to uh, continue to improve my my mental health, physical health. But then at what point or when you when it does come the time that you need help, how to overcome that barrier within your own mind to say, now I can't do it by myself. Now I need someone else's help. It's it's a very difficult barrier to overcome if you if you think about it, especially if you're coming from a di- that place that teaches you that resiliency is so important. Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree. I think those are great points, and it speaks to the heterogeneity of the population, right? So we know mm-hmm. that there are certain folks who are very quick to say, "I need help. I right. need help now. I know I'm not okay, and I don't feel bad saying it." And there are others who are coming either from different cultures or different backgrounds, whatever that might be, um, that yeah. that is looked upon as, "Why would you ever go talk to a stranger about your struggles?" As opposed to keeping it in the family, and we'll mm-hmm. kind of handle those types of things, etc. And So I I think it speaks to cultural awareness of providers and making sure that we're not making any assumptions, cultural humility of providers to not be ethnocentric, to say everything revolves around American culture, Western culture, those types of things. And your conceptualization should be the same as mine. Um, So asking those questions, um, talking about psychoeducation, providing the sense of, okay, well, this sounds like something that may be a little difficult for you. How could we frame that for you and your family so that we could all work together to support you now that you're acknowledging you need a little extra assistance and that you're struggling and those types of things, which isn't necessarily a reflection of something poor upon your family or poor upon your heritage or those types of things. It just means that for this episode in life, you need a little extra help. So maybe we can kind of frame that in a way that is really helpful um, for that individual. The other piece about stigma that we talk about often um, that I really like about kind of dealing with these issues in primary care, like we had mentioned, going to your PCP just for your well check, going to your pediatrician, because a lot of the stigma happens when you go to that PCP or pediatrician um, and say, I'm I'm struggling. And then they say, oh, here's a referral for this psychologist that's across town that I've never met in real life. And I don't know if they accept your insurance. I don't even know if they're actually still working or not. Good Mm -hmm. luck. Go and see this person. We know that 50, 60% of the time, those referrals never get followed up on because it's just too difficult. The landscape is tortuous. It's kind of like, how do I, Mm -hmm. I got to deal with insurance. What about this copay? Is a carve out? And I got to get to this person. And then you're in a building that says psychotherapy or psychology or psychiatry. And that raises people's hackles a little bit about, Mm -hmm. is there something wrong with me? This isn't for me. I don't know if I can do this. So being able to integrate that into primary care is huge Mm -hmm. because, you know, that universal screening piece, one, you fill out a form of seven, nine questions, Mm -hmm. and then your doctor sees it. You didn't have to talk to anybody to say, I'm struggling. You just filled it out. And they said, hey, based on what you've endorsed here, it sounds like you're struggling. Tell me about that. Sometimes right. that's the only nudge people need to be able to start talking about stuff, right? Yeah. So and it's so breaking it's, the it's barrier, a, essentially. Breaking yeah. that barrier, a little bit more um, anonymity involved with that, too, because it's mm-hmm. a number. I'm just filling out this form to myself and then submitting it. I don't have to tell anyone. And then they'll start that conversation. And if they're trained well, they reduce the stigma and the tension around that conversation. So it's really positive and it's not kind of stigma riddled. But then the other piece of integration is, that PCP or pediatrician would say, hey, patient, it looks like you're really struggling here. Tell me about that. And after two minutes, they'd say, you know, I have somebody in my office today, right now, that is a part of my team that I would like to introduce you to to address these issues. Today, without you having to go anywhere else or sign any more papers or anything, they can both evaluate you and start treatment. What do you say to that? 
what would that so all the stigma at that point is a race you don't have to go anywhere you don't have to make a new relationship you already trust your pcp and your pediatrician yeah. that ends up being a, a really nice segue and we've seen really really good outcomes on that front awesome yeah that's i, I completely agree with that that focus on integrating primary care with mental health is so important uh, i want to shift and talk just briefly on phones and social media because i think that there sure. is um a big, it does have a big role to play. Um, one of the most profound experiences I had medically was one uh, after a shift in a hospital in New Jersey when I was over there, when I ran into a psychiatrist as the day was finished at, late at night, seven, eight, eight, eight at night. Um, and he had just come from the ER and, and just seen a suicide attempt in, I, I believe, a nine-year-old, very young. And he said something to me that really stuck to me. He said, Back in my day, bullying ended at 3 p.m. And I thought that was very profound because this was a drained psychiatrist who had just seen a very, very young child attempt suicide. And a lot of that had to do with this constant, you know, the, the, the smartphones and the social media, um, a lot of what goes on there. So, you know... I, I, I think it's important to address because we this is such a big social experiment that we're doing to really just use these phones. Um, we clearly know that they have benefit, but we are not really talking about the, the limitations we should put on them, uh, what social media or phone addiction looks like, what Internet addiction looks like. We, I think that there, there has to be that conversation when we talk about mental health as a whole. And this applies to adults as much as it applies to, to kids because it doesn't matter what age you're at, the, the power that these machines have is very, very extensive in controlling behavior in, in our reward systems. And they're really designed for that. It's, it's no secret that they're designed that way to be more addictive. So I think that there needs to be a lot of conversation around that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and you can confirm to me this or not, but I, I heard that you had um, changed to, to flip phones, you and your wife, um, to, to as an example to your kids. I don't know if, if that's true or not, but um, if it is, I think it's, it's a great example. Uh, personally, I tried a flip phone for about a day um, when I was trying to, uh, you know, negotiate my time with the phone, but just because of the way that our lives are set up and everything sure. is so convenient through the phone, really it lasted only only a day. So yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on all those things. That's so funny, Omar. So <laughs> I, uh, yes, to, to confirm, uh, we were early adopters. I had the very first iPhone um, mm -hmm. way back when um, and had it through kind of the second generation or so. Uh, and then my partner and I, we realized this is this is different, and and we want to model for the kids when they get their first phones, um, they're going to have what we have, and so we shifted back to flip phones. I had the luxury at that time of not being in a transactional business; I wasn't being test, texted for for clinical things. I could be texted, but it was like A A A, you know, like yeah. uh, doing going mm -hmm. through the alphabet that way. Um, and yes, it brought a lot of chuckles, but it also incredibly simplified our lives mm -hmm. beyond. I mean, it was just another it was kind of like I could finally breathe again, you know. And yeah. and so uh, and I say that as my story, that is not supposed to be this ubiquitous. Everybody should do that. Uh, no judgment at all. Every family is doing the very best they can for our family. For a number of years, it worked really well. We were mm -hmm. we probably did that for, you know, five, six years while the kids were in their kind of formative development stage, we just didn't want them to see us with our head down, looking at our palm with a rectangle and, and doing those types of things. But again, we had the luxury of being able to do that. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the point behind it is the most important one is modeling. What are we modeling as parents? What are we modeling as adults for appropriate behavior? What is acceptable behavior? What is happening there? And you're absolutely right. The control, the intensity, um, the nature of what this um, kind of invention in our lives has done um, is profound. It's, it's like nothing. It's not like when they created the Gutenberg press. It's not mm -hmm. like when we the TV came about. And, and that was something. It was, it was impactful. But our brains are changing dramatically. If, if you do believe in evolution, if you do think about those things, we as a species are changing 
so much more in the last 15 to 20 years yeah. than we have because our behavior dictates what future generations are going to look like, what they're used to, all those mm -hmm. types of things. Um, so I think that there is a lot to be said about the extent to which we can both model those things and, and teach ourselves how to, um, you know, engage in interventions, self-interventions for self-regulation um, that can parlay down to our kids and things of that nature. For example, you know, we talk all the time about, um, you know, mindfulness and meditation. Those are two really big things that were kind of floating around for, for a mm -hmm. long time about we really we need to get into this and we need to, yeah. this is important for us and those types of things. Much like therapy, talk therapy, these are biological interventions. Your right. brain structure and neurotransmitters fire in a different way if you're doing this consistently and in, in, in a good format for yourself, just like a phone. Right. So your phone is going to have that same kind of biological intervention, but not in great ways for you. Right. We see these, you know, you know adolescents are infamous for being up late in the dark on their phones, getting up mm -hmm. early, getting up in the middle of the night, doing those types of things. Um, you know, when you brought up that really tragic story about a, a nine year old who's struggling with with bullying, um, you know, at Dell Children's Medical Center working there and, and you work in the ICU and you work in the ED, one of the kind of biggest precursors to a child coming in inpatient was that their parent tried to take their phone away from them or mm. limited their access to it or something like that. Yeah. So from a sense of impulsive behavior as well, right? So in the past, it was, I'm really mad at my parent. I'm going to run away or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now it's kind of like, I don't know what to do with yeah. this immense, overwhelming negative mm -hmm. experience yeah. that I'm having. I have to end that by ending me, those types mm. of things. So if we yeah. can really kind of help folks to understand what that looks like in a positive sense of like, you have this tool, this tool, and this tool to be able to address this overwhelming sense mm. of dread that you're experiencing in the way of distress, um, that ends up being really helpful. One of the, the key evidence-based interventions that we have for suicidal ideation ends up being dialectical behavior therapy, mm -hmm. DBT. Right. And one of the key pillars in it is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. is really being able to, to sit with the distress of your experience and knowing that it is going to pass. It right. is not a forever type of experience and what folks can do with that. But it is really challenging. I think that, you know, the extent to which um, kids are kind of attached to those as extensions of themselves mm -hmm. is a reflection of developmentally appropriate behavior. At its core, kids are supposed to be social. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to connect with other kids. What do you do when all the other kids are connecting mm. through their phones? Yeah. So how do you find that balance? And I talk to parents and try to work with them often about you can't just cut it off carte blanche and say like, okay, this is it. We're not doing this anymore. We're all going to flip phones. That's grounds for a child exploding and, and creating mm. all kinds of issues. Instead, it's engaging with your child. What are you doing on your phone? How, oh, what is that that's interesting to you and what does that look right. like? So kind of uh, colluding with them, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the sense of we're connected here and that's OK. I'm not going to mm -hmm. come down hard on you. And mm -hmm. let's talk about reasonable limits. Let's talk mm -hmm. about, you know, w when can you and when can't you? And if you can't, what does that say? Like if you if you can't separate from that and be outside with me for 20 minutes or right. do this. And and so you try to shape those mm -hmm. behaviors over time and extend the length of those types of things. Um, and it really comes down to family values. I talk to families all the time about what are your values? They're like, I, I don't know what our values are. Well, I think your first value is a family meeting every Sunday. Yeah. I think you're going to sit down every week and have kind of a, a discussion with your kids. I don't care how old they are. It's everybody comes mm -hmm. together and sits for 20 minutes and talks about their week, what went well, what didn't go well, what needs to change, those types of things. Right. That sense of cohesion in a family also lends itself to Let's start working together on some of these things that one person or a lot of us are struggling mm -hmm. with, those types of things. So I think there's a lot we can do, it's just hard. And people mm -hmm. don't want to do hard. They want to do instant gratification. Yeah. And so if the parents can really get into a space where they're um, supporting the, the hard and saying it's okay for things to be challenging for us and we're gonna, I'm tired on a Sunday, I, don't, I just don't want to do this, and they go through it because that's our family value. This is what we do in our family. Yeah. Um, then there is a sense of kind of um, adherence to that over time and a, a, a common understanding of, of, of who the family is. And I think that that ends up yeah. being a really good thing. Yeah, it, it's very hard. I mean, you, you, if you go from your phone to sitting and meditating quietly for five minutes, it's, it's very anxiety provoking because of the amount of stimulation you get from these, these, um, 
machines, really, and it just can't be replicated by sitting in a, in a, quarter, a corner alone. So it's right. very difficult. But like you mentioned, you have to know your values and then speak about them. And so very important. I agree with you on that. So uh, I want to end by asking you um, kind of from a, a bird, a little bit more from a bird's eye view now. So we, there is a, with this epidemic, there's an incredible amount of um, money and resources being poured into the mental health space in the millions and millions of dollar range, or even more, yeah. billions probably. Um, and I think that it's very important to you know know how that money is being spent, what what the best way, in your opinion, is that that money gets spent, and what you see in the, these trends. You know, there there are big telemedicine companies that are revolved around. Um, psychiatry, mental health therapy, trying to make access easier. Um, there are, you know, things for, for kids now. A lot of it revolves around investment into mental health. So so I want to ask you your opinion on how you see all this money flowing and is it going the right places? Or I know you did mention early on that if we put more of our focus into the primary care world, then, and, and you know, then the money has to follow. So a lot of the funding has to go into that primary care, creating those structures where we can integrate primary care at the level of, uh, excuse me, mental health at the level of primary care instead of these maybe, you know, specifically these other um, categories. But I, I just want to know from your point of view what, what you think about the vast amounts of money coming in. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you're accurate. It is in the billions. We've seen... Mm -hmm. um, since the beginning of the public health crisis, uh, private equity um, has has put in. You know, so they started in 2020 around two billion dollars um, of kind of developing and um, investing and doing those types of things. Um, it went up to probably three and a half, four billion um, last year, and this year so far it's over five billion. Um, and I think that that, to a certain extent, may slow a little bit, secondary to the economy and and kind of what's happening there in the general marketplace. Um, but what we are seeing is absolutely an investment here. Absolutely, folks saying, "Oh, okay, the, the entire this was a global pandemic." So now we're talking about a global set of of pockets and uh, checkbooks and things like that. So let's, as private equity is want to do, let's kind of invest in that and try to get create revenue and, and those types of things. So um, it's a mixed bag of sorts. But at the same time, the hope is that at its core, its intention is, is the right thing, is, is helping human beings and reducing that um, kind of disruption and quality of life. So where will things go? And it's hard to predict, but I will say that, yes, I, you know, one of um, kind of the, the things that we're seeing is, is even the, the biggest folks, Amazon, for example, mm -hmm. CVS, Walgreens, right. they're starting to invest and buy up large, mid-sized um, primary care collectives of health systems, of medical systems, of, of groups like that. Um, what I will say, Amazon is a perfect example. I think they had an internal Amazon health kind of entity that they mm. just couldn't get off the ground. So yeah. instead what they're doing is shuttering that and looking at what is working out there, who has good numbers and, and good fiscal standing, and we'll just buy them because we can. And mm. then we'll kind of improve them and, and increase revenue and do all those types of things. Mm. My concern is what they end up doing sometimes is because they don't understand the landscape and they're not a, a group of kind of hospitalists or primary care docs or people who understand what it looks like on the front lines, they want efficiency. Mm -hmm. They cut corners. Yeah. It may end up leading to some additional struggles. Right. They're but business what they people. are really yeah. exactly right. Mm -hmm. So, in that same sense, what they're really good at is things like logistics. Two days or less, we're going to mm -hmm. get that box to you. Right? right. It doesn't matter where you are. We're going to get that to you. And we do that all over the globe. Um, if you if you have a problem with this, we can answer it. If you if this mm -hmm. happens, we can we have an answer to all those types of things. They're really good with that. They're really good with kind of figuring out how to cover a, a wide swath of individuals. And that could be a good thing. One of the things I worry about when we talk to different vendors, um, third party turnkey types of folks in the marketplaces, they're really, really busy trying to scale, mm -hmm. right? They, they, their goal is to get as big as, as fast as they can so that they increase their revenue stream as a function of volume. Healthcare can't really work that well in, if that's your primary kind of plot yeah. line. Instead, you really have to focus on quality of service. And I think that this is where things are changing and in the way of the, the patient um, is, is really 
they're thinking this is about me now and and i am this is how the system should work is you should come to me and i'm your customer and you know and i think that that is something like a, a big kind of company like amazon could address in a meaningful way is you don't have to deal with your your insurance company for everything because you're going to get the runaround. It's going to be challenging. Let us help you with that. That would be a really nice way of creating efficiencies and, and helping people faster. So they're not waiting um, for extended periods of time. You know, I think which kind of um, vendors are, are you looking at that could make a, a meaningful impact over time ends up being folks who are addressing personnel shortages, particularly in rural areas. Mm. Texas is huge. It's bigger than yeah. France, right? So uh, we have so many rural areas that have no providers. Right. Being able to leverage telehealth, being able to leverage these companies that say, we have a psychiatrist for you. We have a, you know, a behavioral health care manager. We can run the collaborative care model, an evidence-based robust model, um, wherever you are in the state. And if you have those types of companies in every state of the yeah. union, then you're doing, you're starting to move in the right direction. Um, right. You know, and then I think the other piece we look for quite a bit is evidence-based, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're providing evidence-based interventions as opposed to just, you know, willy-nilly picking things off the off right. the shelf and saying, let's try this, let's try this, um, mm -hmm. measurement-based care, evidence-based interventions, being able to, to bring all that together to address not just quality care for individuals, but also um, making sure that um, folks are, are being supported wherever they are in the country. Um, I think that's going to be the, the angle that things are going to go in the future. Appreciate that insight that you have a lot of expertise yeah. in this area. So yeah. I really appreciate that. So sure, of course. Um, I think we have so much more to talk about, but I think this is a good place to, to stop and we can maybe continue the conversation at, at a later time about more of the specifics. But I really appreciate sure. you taking the time and it was great speaking with you today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Omar.